Hello there, have you ever wondered what it's like coming to a flower class, not one held in real life, one held on Zoom? Well, here I am, all set up for my next Zoom flower class. You'll notice I've cleared my background, so all my knives and clutter are out of view. Well, they will be out of view once I go on screen. So if you're nervous about Zoom Cloud Class, you don't quite understand how it's going to work, this is the video for you. Hello there, I'm Julie from Julie Davis Flower Workshops and Flower Start, the online flower arranging classes. Before you come to class, I'll send you an email which has got a clickable link in it. And the first time you click the link, you'll have to give permission to Zoom to download the relevant bit of the app, either to your phone, your tablet, or your laptop, whatever device you're using. You'll get asked to enter a passcode before you can join the meeting. And this one, as you can see, has been set to the word spring. So you click the link, enter the password, and then you'll go through to the Zoom app. From there, you may well get invited to test your audio, to test your video, and enter the name under which you want to be known as. You can then type in your name and this will appear on the screen. And then once you have been accepted by the host to join the meeting, it's all systems go. I always record the classes that I host. This means that I can send you the video out afterwards so you can watch it again. And if you can't meet, make the class live, you've got the opportunity of watching on catch up. So here you've got the choice of either leaving the meeting or got it that you understand the meeting is going to be recorded. And what's happening here is Julie, who's hosting the meeting on her laptop, has just accepted Julie, who is joining the class on her mobile phone. And this is the view that I'm getting from my phone. So I've got four items across the bottom, join audio. So I'm clicking on that and that allows Zoom to access my audio so I can hear and speak. Can you see that the start video icon's got a red line through it? If you tap the screen at that point, it'll turn the video on. So at the moment, my video from my mobile phone is the black box with the person in that little icon on the right hand side. As soon as I tap that button, you can now see my live picture coming from my phone. And because my phone is pointing down at my desk at the laptop, that is the image that you can see. And if I tap on that little inset screen, it switches the view, whether I'm watching the view on the laptop or watching it on the view that's on my phone. So you can toggle between the two and there I am waving at myself. Because I record my Zoom videos, I always put my participants on mute. So if you want to ask a question while I'm filming, you'll need to tap the icon at the bottom of your screen that says chat and you type away your message, hit the send button and then it'll appear in the chat box on the main screen. So some, you'll see a little notification flash up very quickly there and then I can tick where it says a number one on that chat box there and then you'll see my message. Hello everyone. You've also got the option of turning your camera screen around. So this little icon on the top left hand side, you just tap that and it will show your face and if you tap it again it'll show the other direction. And when you've finished and you want to leave the meeting, you just need to tap the big red button that says leave meeting. Once you've got over the scary bit of logging on the first time, it really is quite straightforward. And just have a play around with all those buttons. You can't really go wrong. And if you do feel that things are going wrong, you can press the red button to leave the meeting, re-click the link in the email I send you and start the whole process over again. As everyone starts arriving for class, we normally have a little bit of chat. And when everyone has arrived, I put everybody on mute. I spotlight the video and I give an introduction to the class. And this is the bit of the class that gets recorded to you, get given all the chat bits are taken out. Your, your face will never appear and the and lesson will continue. And then you can have the option of you know replaying it, stopping the video, or if you weren't able to join the class live, you can watch it for the first time on the recorded video. So I hope I've been able to settle your nerves a little bit, answer some of your questions. So from this point on, I will let the video run with my real life voice and the teaching class and come back to you at the end of the video. 
response. So we're filming, it's the last day of January filming. There is nothing in my garden at all. It's all looking very sad and gray, or no, it's green actually. And it's it's one of the, it's the time of the year where you just think, what on earth am I going to put into my flower arrangements? So flower arrangements work best, I think, if you have a mix of flowers and a mix of greenery. But in the height of summer, if you've got a garden full of flowers, you could do a flower arrangement and just all flower. I'm kind of moving to the other end of the spectrum because it's winter time and there's absolutely no flowers in the garden, although I think I do have three daffodils. I have clipped some greenery from the garden and I'm thinking I might make a flower arrangement that is just all greenery. Although I do have um, meager offerings from the supermarket. I've got three carnations which are left over from a class. So this morning, I went out into my garden and I've picked a handful of greenery and, and just so I could keep them in water before class, I have dropped them into this, it's an enamel teapot. I mean, it almost looks like I've done a completed flower arrangement already. So um, I have literally just got what I wanted, found the, the nearest watertight container and just kept my flowers in water. So that's the top tip. Whether you're going to a flower class with me on Zoom, or you're going to your flower club or something at your WI, or you signed up for a class with someone else, and they've asked you to bring flowers, pick them from your garden or buy them from the florist or supermarket. But once you've bought them, you should rick up the stem ends and put them in water. And then if I'm traveling to a flower class, I have a bucket that I have in my car with a minimal amount of water in, just in case if it spills over and I haven't flooded my whole car out. And then what I tend to do is I wedge it in the footwell in the passenger seat at the, on the back seat. And sort of if I need to brace it a bit, I move my passenger front car seat right back so it grips in place. And I found that overall um, that does hold your flowers in place. If you arrange your flowers direct from the florist, direct from the supermarket, direct from your garden, you may find that they don't last quite as long but because we are going to be arranging in water and not in flower foam you don't have that added problem of your um your stems drying out in the flower foam so the, the, what you need to do all the time you use any flower or any greenery if you cut from the garden bought from the florist you need to recut the stem end and then put that in a glass of a glass of water before you go to use them and if you look at your flower stems if you do ever buy from the supermarket or your florist by the time you've taken them home, and that might only be, you know, a 10 minute car drive, they've gone, the stem ends do start to dry out. And once they dry out, they sort of seal over at the ends and that stops the water being taken up. And that's why we always make a brand new fresh cut so that the water will take up, the, the flowers will take up water more efficiently. Now, I had, I've, so I've got the mug I'm thinking of using got the teapot I'm thinking oh perhaps I could use that because it's, it's quite attractive in that and then lo and behold I found something else as well so I don't know about you but do you store your celery in a vase or in water or do you put it straight in the fridge so I've actually got this here so over the last few days or actually probably the last couple of weeks my husband's been saying to me when are you going to throw that celery out it hasn't got any stalk worth eating. And I keep saying to him, I'm going to, next time I make a bolognese, I'm going to fry the onions and I'm going to add celery to it. And I have upgraded a little bit because normally we keep our celery in um, a Pyrex jug. We've, I've always kept it in a small amount of water in a jug on the side. And then I went to the charity shop and I bought what I think actually might be a proper celery vase. It looks like a bit like a trophy as if I won something for flower arranging. I suddenly thought, well, if that celery isn't good enough to eat, perhaps I could use it as part of the base of my flower arrangement. So whatever you've got with you, whether you haven't got any flowers at all and you've just come for the entertainment and you're going to see what I do and then make and create in your own time, or if you're going to watch what I do and make later, or perhaps make your flowers as I make it, you can basically use any household item to put your flowers in. It just has to be a container that is watertight. So if in doubt, pour some water in it and just put it on your work surface and you'll soon discover if you get puddling at the end, whether it's not watertight. And the type of things that aren't watertight 
are things like um, you might have a metal jug, and sometimes these are very they're intended for decorative purposes. Although it looks like a nice, robust um, enamel jug, you may find that around the seams it's not quite waterproof. But any kind of mug, glass, wine glass, wine bottle, um, anything like that, you can you can reuse. So don't let me put you off if you have bought a mug to class. I'm actually going to upgrade because at the last minute time my head was turned by my, my vase here, which has already begun to be greened up. And the easiest thing to do when you, you make a flower arrangement is you could do a cut and plonk. Uh, do you do this when you go to the supermarket? You, you buy your supermarket bunch, you know you have to cut your flowers, recut them, and then you'll just put them in a vase and they will just fall wherever they fall. If you want to be a little more um, a designer about it and have a little bit more control of, of your flowers, you have to have something inside your vase, a mechanic that will hold your flowers in place. And this is where good old flower foam used to come in because you soak the flower foam and it was a bit like um, a, a sponge and you put your flowers in and they would stay wherever you put them. So the challenge is because we're trying to be more environmentally friendly, how are we going to hold our flowers in place? Now, there's, there's lots of ways of doing this. You might have heard people talking about chicken wire and pen holders, but the easiest thing to do is to use a piece of tape. So I've actually got a, a specially purchased flower tape. You can, I've chosen clear today because I didn't want the tape to show up on my container, but you might commonly have this in green. And the reason you've got the green one is because you're used to having flower foam and the green tape over the green flower foam attached to a green plastic dish meant that the, the tape disappeared visually. So you may well have difficulty seeing me use this on my container, but I will talk you through it and you'll be able to see what I'm doing. So to start with, I'm going to show you the mechanic to create a grid, and then I'm gonna set that to one side because I don't think I need that tape. So it's all about understanding your flowers, understanding your container, and getting the best mechanic, the thing that will hold your flowers in place that suits your purpose. Don't over-engineer your flower arrangements. You don't want it all to be chicken wire tape, pin holders, and all the rest of it, like an like a, you know, engineering construction when you actually want to see the beauty of your flowers. So at this point, you'll have noticed my camera over the edge here. This is my phone camera. What I'm going to do just to show you a close up, although I might flip between my view head on and the overhead view, is um, how I would do my taping. So I'm conscious of the fact I've got clear tape on a white mug, you may not see very much. So if I shuffle across. Now, this is one of the bits that I normally edit out of the video that gets sent out to you. It's the bit where I shuffle around from me talking to my laptop to showing the close up demonstrations overhead. <laughs> If I put that there, you'll be able to see. So what I'll now do is if I spotlight my camera, you can see my cup of tea over there, I will just main change that. Brilliant. And again, I'm not quite sure what the light's like at your end, um, but I've got this tape. And what I'm doing is putting a checkerboard pattern on the top here. So one piece of tape here, and this tape will only stick if your container is dry. So if you've swilled out your mug, you do absolutely need to make sure you've dried it off the tea towel. So I've got two lines there, one there and one there. And then I will turn the mug around by 90 degrees and put another one on there. So you'll probably have to use your imagination. I will hold it up to the camera just to see whether you can see it, but it's exactly how you would draw a noughts and crosses grid. And again, not, oh, perhaps I can catch the light there. Oh, oh momentary, there, can you see that? So one line, one line, one line, one line. So I have made nine little holes in which I can put my flowers. If you are working on a much bigger container, it may be that you need to do four going this way and three that way. You have to decide you know, how many bits of tape. The advice I'll give you is don't put too much tape on here. 
because you'll have a tiny, tiny hole and you won't be able to put your flower stems in. They may well go in, but if you decide you want to replace something, you may find it tricky pulling it out and don't leave them too big. And it's like everything in flower arranging. A little bit Goldilocks really, not too big and not too small. It just has to be just right. So that isn't very clear there. So what I will do is I'll come back to me, I think, and spotlight me. So I'm going to turn that camera off for a moment, move it out of the way. Again, I'm not sure whether that picks up, but I think if, if you can just, this is why I normally demonstrate using the, the dark green tape, because then you can see it, but I wanted it to, to look like a nice finished piece. So I'm actually going to use my celery vase, and I think that my first piece of greenery, my celery, is going to act as a very effective flower frog. And the reason for that is it's all branched and it's all together um, on the roots. So I can put it in and look, it's starting to look like a flower arrangement already. So if you don't have a piece of celery hanging around, you may be that when you've gone to collect your, your greenery from your garden or whether you've got a supermarket bunch, you may have a piece of greenery in there that is really branched to so one stem and really nice and bushy and I would put that in first get something in your vase in your container that you can start to slide all your other flowers through and I'll help it hold its position a little bit and we're going to make an arrangement that looks um it, it just look pleasing to the eye you need to have had an enjoyable time making your arrangement and when you finished it and put it on the side you want to, to admire it and think Job well done. And that's the reason why I'm going to go with the flow. You'll notice that my piece of celery isn't very even. It's almost mm -hmm. got an asymmetric slant. It's a little bit shorter this end, a little bit taller that end. And I'm just going to go with that. If you wanted something that looked like a mirror image, you would need to perhaps with your piece of greenery, put the main bit of greenery in, cut off the stem here, shorten it a little bit and put it back in. But I quite like, if we're making an arrangement, to have a little bit of character and personality about it. And don't be put off if you've got flowers, some things that are long and some things that are a little bit short. Now, what I always do is if I am arranging a mix of flowers and a mix of greenery, I like to get my greenery in first because it does sort of um, act as a guide as to how big your arrangement's going to be, how wide, how tall, and it does start to fill out quite nicely. And in fact, if I don't have any flowers, I would just be quite happy with an all greenery or all foliage flower arrangement, because you do get a lot of variation in terms of what the florist would say, color, form and texture. Not all greenery is green. This one here is quite a lime green, my celery. I've got some quite dark greens from the garden. You'll get different leaf shapes and things will appear to have different textures. You might get some pieces of foliage that are quite silky. Some might be quite velvety to the touch like Senecchio. You might get some that are quite rough like um, a Salal leaf or quite leathery like an ivy leaf. So it's sort of, you're making a visual feast for your eyes. And I always think at this point about a buffet. I'm sure you've all been to work buffets where everything looked entirely beige and not very appealing because it all looked just the same. But as soon as somebody adds in colorful stuff, tomatoes, your cucumbers and your, your carrots, it just looks much more visually appealing. And the same when you serve like your dinner on a plate, you're, you're enjoying your meal through the taste of it, the smell of it and also how it looks as well. So in terms of my garden greenery, I have literally, as I say, gone around my garden and originally thinking, uh oh, I have absolutely nothing to make my arrangement with. But I have managed to find a few stems. And of course, I haven't got loads and loads of material, but I don't need loads and loads because my celery vase or your mug isn't particularly big. So don't feel under pressure. You've got to get bundles and bundles of greenery. Think about it. And this is quite a nice part of doing your flower arrangements. It's not actually just doing the arranging or admiring it afterwards. It's the prep as well. So I went out this morning, I had my heavy winter coat on, um, I had a pair of my husband's um, gardening shoes on, but it just gave me an opportunity in the still and the quiet of the morning before anyone had come down for breakfast, just to be outside. And it's quite nice experiencing the outdoors when you've just got a few minutes. 
and just going through looking at my garden and I noticed a couple of things I would never have seen from my kitchen window. With spring on the way, we've got some fennel growing, just the little tufts of fennel, which I wouldn't have spotted. And of course, I've got um, the bulbs starting to pull through. So sometimes it's quite nice to be able to walk around. And if you don't actually have a garden, I have previously been making arrangements. If you have pot plants, you could perhaps do a bit of indoor gardening and cut off some of your hot plant branches. Or if you go for a, a walk, if you've got a dog or just enjoy walking, you could take a pair of scissors with you and do a bit of foraging out in nature. But there are foraging rules to, to stick to. So just to be brief, know what you're picking, don't trespass and only pick what you need. Don't pick loads and loads of it. So um, a little bit of a quizette here. Um, this um, plant here, it's got um, skinny little leaves, that are green with a yellow edge around them. And I think this is a pyrus and it's grown in a pot on our front drive. And then next to that, I have got um, a euphorbia. Can you see I'm sort of hesitatingly picking it up? I've picked the euphorbia because I like the rosette head and I'm flower light this time around. In fact, I'm not sure I'm going to put my carnations in, but I thought I quite like the shape of that rosette pattern here. And the reason why I'm holding it rather daintily is because euphorbia is one of the families of plants where you recut the stem and it oozes out this milky sap and it can cause skin problems. It doesn't cause me skin problems but just be aware from your point of view and what the rule would be is that when you recut the stem it'll start to ooze but you can stop the oozing by plunging your stem end in some boiling water or you can strike a match and sort of sear it off um, put it in the gas flame on your hob or if you've got a lit candle and just do that and, and you know hold it in the flame just so it seals the end do I do that every time no, I don't. But um, the reason for that is I'm arranging my flowers to enjoy at home. I'm not doing it commercially to sell on to someone else. And in fact, I wouldn't use anything with a sappy cell if I was doing retail floristry because you've of course, got an added layer of health and safety for the person that is using it. So the reason we normally seal the ends is so that the sappiness doesn't leach into the water and then shorten the life of the um, other flowers and greenery that you've got. I'm just using garden greenery, my carnations, if I put them in, are as you know, tough as old nails. So I'm not going to be overly bothered about that, but just something to think about. And then next to that, I have got some Petoniasta with the little yellow uh, red berries. This is grown, it's a ground cover plant, but we've got it growing vertically up the ugly outside of our kitchen wall. And I'm a little bit hesitant about whether I'm going to use this. It's stiff and it's straight. And if I want to get a nice flow out of my vase, I don't suddenly want to have these sort of fingers of foliage going up. So out of everything, I'm, I'm thinking I might not actually use them. But they were the first thing I picked because they were right outside my back door. I've then got some bamboo. We've got bamboo growing in a pot. If you have it in the ground, it's a bit of a brute and spreads really quickly. Hence, we've got it contained in pots. I'm slightly hesitant about this too, because to me, I don't really like bamboo. It's it, it's obviously very Asian in look, and I've picked everything else I've picked a very sort of English garden greenery, and I'm sort of telling two stories: one, the romance of an English country garden, and then the exotic appeal of something from Asia. So I'm not quite sure whether. Um, it's going to appear harmonious in my vase. Again, I might leave this out, don't quite know. Um, I have got choisia, which is the often known as a mock orange. I bought, I picked that again for the rosette shape head. I think I prefer the rosette on my euphorbia. Um, a little, a really short piece, because the way I keep trimming at the bush, there aren't any long pieces, but you know, I could have that at the outside edge of my vase. It doesn't really matter how long your bits of greenery are, as long as the stem ends are actually in water. I then picked some bay, and I tried to pick the bits of bay that, where the leaves haven't got too big yet. So I have actually got laurel in my garden, plenty of laurel, but the leaves on the laurel are, are quite large and everything else I've got in my vase is quite small, almost dainty. And I was thinking if that's going to go in a mug, 
the laurel is going to be too big. So I've gone for the laurel shape, but in the smaller size of the bay leaf. So there's a couple of those. And then for the flower rangers in the class, this is quite a popular flower rangers foliage. It is a, an arum leaf. It's arum pixum italicum, I believe. And it's got this marbled finish to the leaf. And this is grown quite easily in the garden. It's really exotic. Um, but it only it comes into leafage in the wintertime, sort of January to April. Come the end of April, it's started to die off and, and uh, you won't see it then in the garden until it pops up next spring. But quite a nice exotic one. I've got a single stem of privet. It's slightly yellow, which I'm not sure is the variety or whether it's the poor growing conditions it's in. And then coming back closer, back onto my patio, I've got these dried stems and I have not got a clue what these are. I'm thinking that they might be the dried flower of the oregano herb. I'm not entirely sure. But again, I thought, you know, I was struggling to put something in my vase quite like the look. Can you see them silhouetted against my, um, my kitchen cupboards? So again, do I put it in? I don't need to, if I don't want to. I will say it's shattering little bits of seed all over my worktop. So it doesn't matter in the kitchen while I'm working because I can clear it all up afterwards. And actually, once I've cleared up, it won't matter that it has the potential to shatter because when this vase of flowers, my mug of flowers gets put where I want to display it, I'm not going to be fiddling with it. It's just going to sit. So the only chance of, of um, it shattering again is when I take it back out from my living room and I start to um, tip the water away and put the, the greenery in my compost bucket and by then I'll be all set to tidy up again. So let's see what we're going to do with this little lot. So first of all you need to make sure you've got water in your container. So um, I might as well use the water in the teapot to fill in. And it's entirely up to you how much water you put in. The watchword is that if you want to create an arrangement that's got a bit of sideways spill and perhaps you're going to put your, your materials in a slightly jaunty angle so they come out, you've got to make sure that the water is high enough that the cut end is in water. Otherwise, quite obviously, you're going to wonder why is that piece of plant material dying? It'll be because you haven't put enough water in your container. But you don't have to always put everything just straight up and down into your vase. It will just sit like a cut and plonk a very inspiring, uninspiring bunch. So play with it. See, you know, go high with your water and then see whether you can get things to stretch out and, um, you know, occupy their space. So that is what I'm going to do here. Have a little go. So I'm recutting the stem ends and then sliding them into my vase. So I've gone for my fancy leaves first and that sort of started to hook around the, um, the celery that's there. And I'm going to put this arrangement probably on my mantelpiece. So I know that when I have finished the arrangement, the mirror on my mantelpiece is going to be here. So I only need to put my flowers or my greenery into the front area. So not absolute total front. When I say a front, I sort of mean 180 degrees of being the front. So that if I approach the fireplace from the side, it still looks like it's a complete arrangement. I just want, don't want to put so much in the back that when I put it on the, the mantelpiece, that everything gets crushed that way. And then you run the risk if you had a heavier, bigger arrangement, that it all falls off the mantelpiece. So I'm going to just flick that round. So I've got three of these fancy leaves. So I'm going to doing one to each side and one out to the front like that and if you if you like a rule in flower arranging threes of a number all you need to do is count up to three one two three of a placement put them in as a triangle i've got one to the side one to the side one to the front so if i look from the top it has formed a triangle and you also want to count threes as well you know i would say as a minimum minimum three types of greenery and if you're working with your flowers you want to go small medium and large in size so all you need to do be able to count to three. And then I will twist this back to me and think, well, what else should I add in? You know, should I be, if I've cut this stuff, I'm just going to put it all in, I think. So I'm going to hold that up. I won't want to come too high. I don't mind coming up a little bit, 
but I don't want to come too high. And I do know that I will need to take off some of these lower leaves. So anything that goes into your water needs to be on a clean stem. And that just means to have no leaves on it. If you've got leafage in the water, it will, it will rot. And that is the, what happens where, I don't know if you've ever noticed, you've tipped your vase of flowers away and you've got this sort of gunky smell in that old pond water. And that's what it is. You've had a leaf or something has fallen into the water and has started to rot. So it's, it sours the water and it makes it go a murky, you know, dirty brown colour. It stinks. And if you had really nice flowers, it will shorten the life of your flowers. Um, and you don't want to, to do that when you have, um, you know, spent your hard-earned money on flowers. So having said there are rules of three, the, I've only got two pieces of this bamboo, um, but you no. Know, why be stuck by the rules? So I'm having this one a little bit shorter. I've got this tall one up here. I might come out to the front with that one at the edge there. So I'm making my arrangements come out this far, but it's still narrow at the back and I've got some height. And if I was to draw that, you know, in my mind, I've got, you know, this sort of triangle shape coming out at the bottom like this. And it's also vaguely triangle shaped coming out at the back there so just nice to keep that in mind but don't be hung up on the rules do what intuitively you want to do um, and just make sure every time you recut the stem ends and they're actually sitting in water so um privet next so slide that one in at the top and I've got to pick a mix. And the reason why I didn't pick three of everything is number one, because I didn't have three stems of everything. But if you are buying from the supermarket, you'll find that there's always two of this, one of that. It's never got a flower ranger's pack of flowers. So you, you just have to get used to not actually having what you need. So this bit of bay here, I've pulled off that leaf. My bay always gets nibbled. So I'm pulling that off as well as the leaves that are going to be in the water. Recut the stem ends. And then this is when you become an artist. You can turn your vase around and you're having a look. Do it need to be over here, over here? I can see a gap. So I've gone in over there and there's also a little bit of a gap here. So that's where the next one will go in. And the beauty of arranging your water is if you don't like it or what you've made, Take it all out and start again. And then you haven't wasted anything. It's not like you've got a piece of flower foam with pock marks all over the place. So you can start to see it's just greening up, as we would say in the trade. Um, I'm going to try and use everything I've, I've bought or picked from the garden so I don't waste it. I mean, this is a tiny piece. It's barely bigger than the stretch from my finger to thumb. So I will recut the stem end. And this one, I might have coming out of the front of the vase, just under that first leaf that I put in. You see it's coming out over the top. So don't think that your vase or your little cup of flowers needs to be just straight up and down. You can get what we call the profile to it, the 3D look. And the other thing I was going to say is um, remember which is the front of your arrangement. You don't have to have a front. If you were doing something nice and small in your mug, you could put your flowers in so it looked good from any direction. But because I know that my celery vase is going on my mantelpiece, um, I've definitely got a front and the back is sparse. And that is helped here because I've got these two massive handles on the side. So I'm not going to be mistaken about suddenly thinking, oh gosh, was the handle front or the side? My handles are on the side and the, um, and, and the flowers are coming out at the front there. And all the time, just having a little look. So what are we going to do now? So I can see here that I'm ready to put in what I'm thinking of as being my focal flower. I know it's a piece of green, but it's focal. I like this rosette form, but I don't particularly like these longer leaves. They're just sort of detracting a little bit. So carefully, I'm going to pull these off. And as I pull them off, or just I'm sort of squeezing them off, I can see that the, the sap is starting to ooze again, but I know that I'm not affected by the sap. 
If you are worried that you might be, number one, don't use euphorbia. Number two, you could always put on those little disposable gloves. And number three, if you're worried about it, you need to um, sear those cut ends to stop the sap leaking out into your vase. So I'm going to put that down. But if I had roses, if I was doing this in the height of summer, I would, once I got my basic green in, that's when I start to put my flowers in. And I would probably put a real rose just there. And can you see, as you come up the vase, or up the side of your mug, my rim of my vase is here. And immediately, I've got this focal flat. It's as if my chin is resting on the edge of the container. So I always like to have the focal area, the focal flower, the sort of attractive bit your eye goes to, right up. It, well, it's probably a centimetre or so above the rim, but I've kept it low. And again, if you like another rule, the, the uh, accepted way of arranging flowers is to have your more impactful, your largest flower, your darkest flower set low. And then as you come to the outer edges of your arrangement, whether that's out to the side or out to the top, you have the, the smaller pieces, so that would be your buds. So if you can imagine this being a rose, you'd have your fully opened rose at the bottom, and you'd have your part opened roses coming up and to the side and then right at the edges of the arrangement you'd have the roses when they were still in bud imagine some of those really small spray roses you could do a mix in there but quite often we find if you're buying your flowers in the supermarket all your roses will be the same size your gerbils will be the same size and your carnations will be the same size but it's just being aware if you ever look at look at your arrangement think there's something not quite right about this it may be because you put your biggest flower at the top and your small buds of flowers at the bottom. And it just gives that, that look that the whole thing sort of top heavy and is ready to roll forwards. So it's about calming your eyes by just using that basic building block, big flowers at the bottom, slightly smaller, and then the little buds all the way around the edges. So what else can we put in here? So I've got my choice here. It's a bit leggy, this choice here. I'm going to, to pull off the greenery. Um, I'm gonna be ending up with that. The buds here, there's little buds developing, they may come into flower. It's sort of got a visual linkage to that piece of euphorbia that I put in earlier. So what I've done, euphorbia is there and choisia is there. So there's kind of like a visual link. You land on the choisia and then you just hop skip and you're, you're noticing the little buds of the choisia. So what I'll do is I'm going to send the recording out to you. I will take a photograph of this so you can actually see it properly at the end and then you'll be able to appreciate what I was saying and then another sort of eye-catching piece is my pieris so this is a nice variegated form I want to be able to see that as well I'm going to rest that off to one side that went in just there I'm thinking now can you see it's, there's a little bit of gapage up here and I'm thinking this might be a great place to put in these dried stems which I think are oregano now because they're dried Technically speaking, they don't have to be in water. And in fact, it will probably make the ends go a little bit mouldy with them being in water. Um, but I'm going to arrange them as if they were a live plant in order that they can lock into position. Otherwise, they might just be fluttering around a little bit too much. And as I say, I'm just doing this for personal pleasure. You may you know, be doing this in your little coffee mug. So you don't need to have it you know, lasting forever. You know, if it gives you two or three days pleasure, that is fine. In actual fact, um, I made a much bigger arrangement like this on my YouTube channel last week, and it is still looking perfect. And with it all being greenery, it'll last for weeks and weeks and weeks, provided I remember to just put my finger into the vase and make sure I can still feel wetness on my the tip of my finger to um, satisfy myself that there is enough water in the vase. So can you see there, I've just put, I've gone one, two, and then I've got a little bit out of the front there. So where I've got three pieces, I don't put them at the same height, trying to vary the heights as well and have some materials coming out and some tucked in. And we call that being recessed when something's tucked quite low into the arrangement. So I have got in front of me a pile of leaves. I've got my Catoni Aster, which is the only thing now that I haven't put in. And I'm thinking, do I put that in or not? So I know that I have to take off the green, the leaves that are going to be inside the vase. 
I know I have to recut the stem end. And it's actually got quite a, a, not a pleasing arch. So sometimes when you do have the material that's got a linear look to them, very carefully, you can manipulate it a little bit. And I'm going to put it in, and if it looks awful, I'm going to wiggle it out. So here goes, I've kept it long. And it's kind of following the line of that piece of celery, but I think it's probably, you know, sort of, here's the arrangement and it's bouncing off the other end. So I think possibly I need to wiggle it out and I might actually cut it here to make it shorter, then get rid of those leaves and then reposition it in. So I've got a bit of, uh, um, I've got a bit of extension to the vase, but, but not exaggerated. I'm not suddenly making the arrangement overly large. So that seems to have fitted in quite nicely. And then I've got quite a bushy bit here. So taking off those leaves, putting them in there. I think I quite like that there just coming out to the edge. It just sort of um, supplements that area. I was ending up with the piece of celery like that and the piece of cotoneaster like that, and I was having a gap in the middle. So I have filled that in there. And then I'm thinking, well, I've got two pieces that side. Perhaps I should, oh, and look at this. If I put this one in this side, can you see that's gone arch that way? So I've been able to make use of the natural arch the material. I'm not trying to make it do anything false. And that again is a, at the top tip. You cannot make your greenery do things it doesn't want to do. You can sort of play with accentuating the stem to it, but you'll never get, you know, a twisted bit of greenery to stand up straight. So you are at the, the whim of mother nature. She will decide whether or not you have success with what you're wanting to do. And then we come to the three white carnations. And you know what? I'm not going to put them in because I think that that looks so lovely with the, the clear glass container. It's got a bit of ridging on here, which is sort of slightly sliding the stems. But I think because of the light, airy look it's got, and it is quite a visual feast for the eyes because I've made a point of thinking about my colour, form and texture. I think to add in flowers for the sake of it, may be a retrograde step. But if I was going to add flowers in, and these have come out of another arrangement, I would put them in a different height. So I've got my tall one, my shorter one, and my smallest one. And I would probably put them in like, like that, like I sort of lay that over the top. Perhaps we'll have a go. I don't think, you, know, I, you never know, I may change my mind. So that's the shortest one at the bottom. And then, a slightly taller one I need to cut a little bit off there. Wiggle it in. And now I've got so much in the bars, I am really having to wiggle things in a little bit. No, perhaps, you know, you'll have to let me know whether you think, does it improve it or not? So that's how you'd get your flowers in. So if you've got a mixed bunch of supermarket flowers, I would put the the impactful ones in first, the focal flowers, so that might be your carnation or your rose or your gerbera. And I would then layer up with your next smallest flower. So it may be that you've got um, a spray carnation or a spray chrysanthemum or lisianthus. And once you've got those in to sort of fill up the gaps, and at the end, I put in your tiny flowers. So at this time of year, it might be you've got wax flowers, the beautiful lemon scented flower that's pink, or you might use jip or perhaps even solidago, the bright yellow, and just sort of blend everything. So it doesn't look like you've done an arrangement by painting with numbers. So I'm not convinced, carnations aren't my favorite flower. I'm not massively convinced about the carnations, but for the purposes of today's demonstration, I shall leave it at that. So what I'm going to do now is um, I am going to stop the recording and then the usual part of class is we have a little bit of a live Q&A at the end, which is the, it's the beauty of doing classes on Zoom because of course, when I do my Facebook Lives and my YouTube Lives, you're having to type in all the time. So um, I will stop the recording now and take myself off spotlight and then we can go to gallery view and we can have a little bit of a chat. 
Well, that's the end of the class. And here is my finished all foliage arrangement. In the make and create afterwards, we decided that the boldness of my carnations just didn't work. It made it look like I'd been throwing snowballs at my arrangement. But if I had had some smaller flowers, the transitional flowers, perhaps some lisianthus, some white spray carnations and some jip or a smaller flower to finish off, it would have looked much, much better. But for now, I'm rather pleased with my cut from the garden at no cost arrangement. And although I've made mine in a celery vase, you could quite easily do exactly the same thing, but using your favourite mug. So all I've got to do now is clean up the mess that's left on my kitchen table, put my kitchen back to rights. If you've been a bit worried about coming to Zoom flower class, I hope this video has put your mind at rest and perhaps you might like to share it with a like-minded friend and you could come to class together. That's all for me for now and I'll see you again next time.